for life, we, we need to not have equilibrium because the equilibrium state in physics, the, the, the state that every system wants to get to is its equilibrium state, or we call it its ground state. For us, that equilibrium state is death. So we need to keep moving. We need to, that's exactly <laughs> it. We need to keep moving. Philip Moriarty is a professor of physics in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Nottingham. Philip's research interests span a number of themes in nanometer scale science with a particular current focus on single atom slash molecule manipulation using scanning probes. Now, I don't have a clue about what I've just said, but let's just agree for the sake of it that Philip knows a lot about quantum physics. Philip is also an avid heavy metal fan and he likes to explore the deep and fundamental connections that exist between quantum physics and heavy metal. He has even written a book about it called When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven or How to Explain Quantum Physics with Heavy Metal. Philip is not your ordinary scientist and he has been interviewed and written for The Independent, The Guardian, Times Higher Education, BBC Radio 4, and The Economist, amongst others. In this episode, we discuss with Philip about the concept of entropy, we answer the question, do particles die, why you should invite a physicist to speak at your funeral, and why quantum physics doesn't prove anything about a possible afterlife, despite what some articles would tend to suggest. Please support the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media and to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, sign up for our newsletter at deathandguard.com. It will also be a massive help to us if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you can do right now by simply clicking the subscribe button. Now, get ready for this episode, a physicist at a funeral. We all know about death in, in this present world, you know, the day-to-day -day death, we all die. But what happens is this realm of, of, if we go to this quantum level, how is death? Is it the same thing that we know? When you took a look at these particles, are they immortal? Are they always there? Are they dying? Are they disappearing? I have no idea. Yeah. Do, are, do we really die? That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. What a really great question. So like, there's a, a physicist, a guy called Sean Carroll, who would probably call himself a cosmologist who looks at particle physics and how that connects to so the smallest of the small and how that connects to the largest of the large. And he looked at this a number of years back. I think my views are pretty closely aligned with, which, with, with Carol's in that we're made of atoms. We don't even have to go down to the, the, you know, the sub, sub, sub particle level. We don't need to think about what's inside the nucleus or whatever. We're made of atoms. Those atoms you know, exist and will continue to exist long, be long after we're gone in terms of long after we've passed away, those atoms get broken down, we get broken down, those atoms get, react with other things in the ground. As we decay, God, this is morbid, as we decay, it's not like those atoms are disappearing. In that sense, we are forever. It's just a question of our consciousness versus our physical state. So in terms of the atoms that comprise us, they're forever in many ways. In terms of our consciousness, and the biochemistry and the electrical impulses that make us up, that is unfortunately not forever. Unless we can find a way to store that, but it's more than just storing it, it's, it's recreating the process of consciousness because we tend to think of, well, if we had enough storage space, we could capture somebody's personality and we could upload it. But consciousness is a lot more than that. It's more about process rather than just solely storage. We don't even need to, to think too much about quantum physics. That defines how the atoms are made up, of course, and we're all made up of, up of atoms and they, they, they bond, but we don't really need to think at a very much deeper level than that to realize that well, the, the physical side is always gonna be there. 
it'll be scattered and it'll be in different states. But when we die, it's really that consciousness thing. And that's a massive question, open question in science, is just exactly what is the nature of consciousness. So the physical matter is what yeah. remains, as opposed yeah. to who we are uh, as, as a holistic sort of whole. Precisely, precisely. So there's a great, um, I would really like to read out some bits of this. It's by a guy called Aaron Freeman, and it was from the National Public Radio. There was a, a program about... Oh, over 10 years ago now and it's an it's a eulogy from a physicist for you know so somebody speaking at, at at a funeral i find this incredibly moving and incredibly visceral as a physicist let, let me let me read from it you want a physicist to speak at your funeral you want the physicist to talk to your grieving family about the conservation of energy so that they will understand that your energy has not died you want the physicist to remind your sobbing mother about the first law of thermodynamics that no energy gets created in the universe and none is destroyed. You want your mother to know that all your energy, every vibration, every, well, he got BTU of heat, every bit of heat, let's put it that way, every wave of every particle that was her beloved child remains with her in this world. You want the physicist to tell your weeping father that amid energies of the cosmos, you gave as good as you got. To me, that really, is, it really speaks to me in that we make an imprint on the world. And we make an imprint on, that, on the world in many levels. And for me, I'm, I'm an atheist. I grew up in an incredibly um, Catholic background. Keith, you know all about rural Ireland in the 80s and 90s <laughs> and 70s, like myself. So it was incredibly, incredibly religious background. And I rejected that at a fairly early age. You know, it's always painted like atheists and scientists are painted as these automatons sort of unfeeling emotionalists who don't think about, you know, the mortality or don't uh, really take on board the concerns of, I don't know, non-scientists or whatever, that we're, we're, we're sort of emotionless and passionless. And that pisses me off a lot because a um, major aspect of science is you have to be passionate to, to, about science. You have to be connected. You have to be engaged. I really like that eulogy because it is. It's all about making your you making your your stamp on the world, laying your stamp on the world, be it through relationships, or leaving some understanding of of the bigger picture, and that you know there's an immortality you know associated with that. When I hear the words that you just read, there's something connected to you know uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said something about we all in in our DNA we are in our bodies there's this the, the stars we're all made of stars we're all made of particles from this universe you know and we kind of contribute all you know us there's a link we are connected somehow and somehow we do we do we help to carry on or do we help this this kind of life or I don't know but there's something about that and I like it a lot actually I like mm -hmm. it a lot what, what what you just read that's ultimately that's where the atoms come from we're, we're, we are stardust we're created all those atoms are, are created in stars that's how we come to be then you add in evolution on top you add in the those incredibly complex molecules that allow us to carry on that genetic information etc it's beautiful it's incredible and knowing more about that and trying to understand that more doesn't detract from that beauty it adds to that beauty it really does add to that beauty if you, if you get a better understanding the problem is some people take it a little bit too far I, you know i'm fairly left of center and collective in my politics so that's something you shouldn't sometimes dodgy to admit that online in certain places these days um, but i am and you know for me i'd like nothing more than a, a beautiful universe where we're all part of one interconnected whole and sometimes quantum mechanics is painted like that 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 really quantum mechanics tells us that you know we're all part of this universal as a sometimes called wave function unfortunately not unfortunately not it doesn't work like that in terms of the matter so we've got atoms those atoms combine in different ways we get animate we get organic matter, we get inorganic matter, and it's chemistry ultimately, and it's biochemistry, and there are certain key principles. So in that sense, we're connected. But in the broader sort of mystical Eastern philosophy right. type sense, that's that, unfortunately, there's absolutely no evidence at all right. that, that that is the case. I suppose it's, it's <clears throat> going back to what, what you said at the beginning, it's we know that matter is all connected. It's almost like we can't know that the, the consciousness isn't connected because we don't know yet know what it is. <laughs> so. That's a really good one. Coming back to, to Steve Carroll, so it's, it's uh, to, to Sean Carroll, that's a really good point, Keith. And it, it's a question of the, the limits of science. And, you know, I could just class myself as an atheist. The true scientific position should be agnosticism. 
You know, I know that. But it's a question of belief and beyond belief. And for me, there are an infinite number of possibilities. The, the example I really like to use is, let's say I believe that the entire universe uh, following Douglas Adams was indeed sneezed out of the nose of the great green Oracle seizure. <laughs> prove me wrong. Definitively <laughs> prove me wrong. And then th there's a, there's, there's an interesting case because, and there's the sort of Russell's teapot argument, Bertrand Russell's, you know, we don't know in fact that out there orbiting a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, there isn't a teapot. We don't definitively know that. Or we don't know that there isn't a universe out there populated by biros or whatever. You know, all those types of things. The issue is that, you know, how far do you take your agnosticism? Now, Carol makes a really good point is that, you know, in terms of the moon, you know, it may well be green cheese. You know, it could be that because we've only sampled the top sort of portion of the moon's surface, how do we know that actually right at the core of the moon, let's say 100 meters diameter, it's not made of green cheese? There's a question then, where do you suspend your disbelief? And that's yeah. a difficult question. And when you combine that with, um, there are just basic uncertainties in science or not an awful lot of scientists and indeed science students, particularly physicists, physicists, physicists tend to be a little bit too arrogant at times, some physicists, who have this idea that science is so incredibly objective and science proves this and science proves that in a very real sense, if that doesn't sound too BBC Radio 4 thought for the day, in a very real sense, science really proves nothing. It doesn't, pr you know, in that, you know, you make the measurement, you assume that actually you're going to take another sample under the same conditions, you're going to get exactly the same measurement and that you're going to do that time and time and time and time and time again. Mm. But there's nothing deductive, there's no deductive proof to say that this is what you're going to get. You're relying to a certain extent that, well, it, I did it a thousand times, the thousand and first time I do it, it's going to be exactly the same. It's, it's the same question, is, is where do you suspend your disbelief? Where do you suspend your belief? <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's exactly, exactly the that. same. Yeah, it's exactly that. When it comes to sort of death and the afterlife, etc., you know, I really, uh, it, it does wind me up, you know, and, and it comes from both sides. You know, you'll have quantum physicists and you have people like Deepak Chopra and others like him saying that, uh, it's not quantum physicists, quantum woo people, so people who take <laughs> quantum physics and, you know, <laughs> mix, it, mix it with the sort of Eastern side of things and really bizarre philosophy. And then they'll have things like, well, quantum physics tells us we're all interconnected or quantum physics tells us that there's definitely an afterlife. Or indeed, I remember the headlines, quantum physics proves that there is an afterlife. When that just is not the case, quantum physics. But it, it also, that's from one side, but there's also this. I have this on my shelf. So I brought it. You see, God, the failed right. hypothesis, how science shows that God does not exist. You know, so I'm an atheist, so you'd think I'd be jumping up and down about this and going, science shows nothing of the sort. Mm. In terms of a definitive proof, we will have never have a definitive proof that there's no God or that there's no, there's no afterlife. We will, would simply never have that. Um, because even if you have the most grandiose, complicated theory, you've still got to get empirical evidence. And how are we going to get that empirical evidence beyond the grave? Well, we can only work with the data we've got. That's the thing. And I think that's the, the suspending belief, the suspending disbelief. It's... Uh... And it's, it's like the whole atheist thing. I, I definitely put myself more sort of agnostic just based on the discussion we, we're just having. But I, I do like the, uh, and you say, where do we draw the, where do we suspend the disbelief? I think, I think a good point is that when we stop killing each other in the name of what we don't know, <laughs> I think that's Absolutely. a good line. It's uh, after that, all discussions are valid to a degree. Yeah, yeah and religion obviously, uh, you know, embeds, and really strengthens the sort of tribal nature of so many human interactions. But then so too, I would say, does many aspects of atheism. That can be incredibly tribal and incredibly fundamental and incredibly close-minded. Some of the very best evidence-based and rational arguments and discussions I've had have not been with fellow atheists, have actually mm. been with those of faith, which really sort of worries me at, 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 at many levels because there, there is this... This arrogance, as I said, particularly, you know, if you take an atheist and you take a particularly um, trench and, and, you know, entrenched physicist who is really, really um, focused on everything is objective and science tells us everything is like this. You combine those two together and you can end up with an arrogance, which basically is, well, if you believe in God 
um, then you're obviously on a lower intellectual plane than I am. And that attitude really pisses mm -hmm. me off. Really pisses me off. I was waiting for you actually to mention these articles about this uh, quantum coup. You know, I remember a video that you did, you know, about the afterlife. And you were just like so pissed off, like just like, what the hell? Quantum physics doesn't prove yeah. uh, afterlife or whatever yeah. you think, you know. And, and, but you see so many of these, of these articles, you know, well, not so many now, but uh, I remember on my Facebook feed sometimes like, well, look, it's proven. Yeah. So I can I can point the finger at um, people like, you know, Deepak Chopra and the people that sort of propagate that quantum woo. But, you know, one of the and, you know, you can say that, well, that's not scientific evidence. And there's, you know, they're, they're, they're basically taking fairy tales and myths, but it comes from all sort of sides of the spectrum. One person who so she Chopra certainly winds me, but I think Chopra's fairly harmless. One person who really winds me up, and I don't know if you've heard of him, I, I guess you have, somebody called Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Called, right, so yeah. Peterson is, he's doing exactly the same thing, really, really abusing science, particularly when it comes to things like lobsters, um, <laughs> and basing, you know, the entire sort of hierarchy of social interactions and relating them back to lobsters. And this, this book is a bestseller. It's absolutely flying off the shelves. 12 rules for life. 12 yeah, rules 12 rules for life. Exactly. Yeah. And it is the most remarkable um, book in terms of the lack of substance, but dressed up in a very, just like Chopra does. Taking, it's like all the right words, but not necessarily in the right order, or taking something very, very trite and dressing it up as if it's something profound. And it seems to me that that's, that's if you really want to make a lot of money very quickly, that's the way to go. That really is the way that's to go. That's what we need to do, Olivier. So that's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's the, our new model. Yeah. <laughs> to, to be honest, you know, and I will be very honest with you, Philip, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson kind of impressed me, actually, because I started to look at some of, the, of his lecture online. You know, it's two hours and a half lecture each episode. Sure. Sure. And, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you just listen to a man speaking and talking, just like, fuck's sake, he's just like, you but, think but, that, that he has like this kind of view of the world and he has answered for everything. So, but, but, and you're, you're right. I mean, I'm not sure that he has any evidence to back this up, but it looks like very sure of himself. But it does, it's as you say, it looks like. That's yeah. the important yeah. thing. So I, I would advise you to do this. He is an incredibly charismatic person. Mm. I don't know if this is possible, but even more charismatic than yourself, Olivia, which is pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> damn charismatic. That is, that's quite a claim, Philip. That's quite it a claim. That's yeah. a claim. That's it is. But, but that, he's, and when you see him speaking, it, it, there's an acting element of that. There's an awful lot of this and looking off into the distance and hands to the head and really feeling the pain, feeling the pain of all of this. So he's an incredibly good performer, I would say. Right. Transcribe what he's saying. Write down what he's saying and, and, and just read it through. And it is vacuous. It is beyond vacuous. Yeah. It is trite often. And then you go back to his Maps of Meaning book. We're getting off the subject of death a little bit. But, but you know, to be, fair to, to be fair to, you know, I guess in terms of Peterson, he's a fairly class half empty person. He, he reckons that we just got to live with all the pain, etc. Well, you go back to something like Maps of Meaning, which was yeah. something he taught to Harvard students. You look at some of the diagrams with bloody dragons chasing their tail and eating each other and chaos, the you know, feminine side is chaos. And it's just bonkers. I get emails written in green, you know, in green fonts, flashing bloody gifts from the 90s with people telling me that they've discovered a brand new theory of the universe that make more sense than Peterson stuff. But when he presents it, He's incredibly assured, self-assured, and he looks, much like Chopra, he looks as if there's substance to this. And of course, you add in the fact that he's a tenured professor and he's at the University of Toronto. He's got those apparent credentials. It's interesting. He seems to think that the whole of academia is rotten to the core. Um, you know, English lit needs to go. Sociology needs to go. It's interesting, of course, that psychology, which is his field, is a social science, and yet he's, he's, he's railing against so many aspects of universities. But actually, if there's one field of study that really needs to be looked at carefully, it's psychology. 
which is um, okay. Peterson's, so much of that data is irreproducible. Not, I'm not talking about Peterson's per se, but the entire field. Again, that brings us back in a sort of long-winded way to what we were talking about in terms of consciousness and in terms of... <laughs> wow, <laughs> we, we got wow, back, we got wow, back wow. We got back, fairly awkward segue, but we got back there in terms of consciousness and, um, you know, whether what's out there is, you know, an objective reality or is it really just our perception of it? And that's a massive, coming back to quantum, that's a massive question in quantum. Do, do the measurements we make in quantum physics, do they tell us about the universe as it is or well, just our information? Yeah. Exactly. Can, can, can <laughs> yeah, I ask you actually yeah. a, a question? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the laws of thermodynamics at, at the very beginning. You know, there's mm -hmm. a law, you know, but I've never been able to kind of figure it out, you know the law of entropy or something like that, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so to me, I, I, let me try to explain it and tell me if it's right or I'm just like stupid, but I, I, I may sound, is it like if, if, if everything tend to fall or like tend to distort itself or to, to break in a long period of time, is it this, the, the law of entropy? Oh, yeah, yeah, kind I, okay, of, so, kind of. So I've yeah. I've done with the um, that sixty symbols channel with Brady Howen. I've done actually three separate videos on entropy, and yeah. I'm allowed to swear. Am I allowed to swear on this? You, yeah. you need to. Yeah, okay, of so course, done, actually, you swear. You you you're not swearing enough at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done three separate videos, and each time I fucked up the explanation. It is okay. not easy, and particularly in a sort of five minute or 10 minute framework, there is a reason why, you know, thermodynamics courses are 20 and 30 lecture courses or 20, you know, 20 or 30 hours. And even then that just begins to scratch the surface. So the first law of thermodynamics is relatively straightforward. So there are four laws of thermodynamics. There's the first, the second, the third, and the zeroth. <laughs> so, so, you know, Physicists just love to make things awkward. But the first law is pretty straightforward, which is just conservation of energy. Energy is conserved, just change from one form to another. The second law is really quite tricky. Now, as it's explained, it's always about, you know, disorder. And that systems tend to um, get more disordered. That captures some of it. But what frustrates me is, you know, the reason the, your room gets messy you know, the reason the room is not some fundamental law of thermodynamics, Olivia. The reason your room gets messy is because you're messy. It's not a, fun, it's not a fundamental law of thermodynamics. So it's the, the thermodynamics, those laws correspond or relate to matter that is not organic, that is not a living. Matter that's really, you know, it's like lumps of silicon or gases like oxygen or processes like steam engines etc like that we can transfer it to humans but the problem is it's like so much of quantum mechanics as well you can't just transfer those laws and just assume that because they work on a piece of silicon or they work with mm. water or they work with steam that naturally they also work with humans what it's all about is that when you you take a, a system it will naturally move away from an ordered state to a more disordered state. That bit of it you've got right. But the problem is how do you define order and how do you find disorder? So for example, if it was really the case that it was only something that ordered always becomes something disordered, we'd never have crystals. You know, you know, you can buy those little crystal growing kits. I don't know if you see them in the shops where right, for yeah. kids where you go and you, you get a crystal. Well then that is, or even a snowflake. You know, in terms of water crystallization, and so going from a, a liquid state, a very disordered state where the atoms and molecules are all jiggled around, and they form a crystal. So you have to be very careful in terms of how you think of, of disorder. And, and it's not really, a better way to think of about it is the number of configurations something can have. So you, you move from a state where the atoms and the molecules, if you can find them, you know, let's take a salt for example and if you if you melt salt or you dissolve salt what happens is you go from a crystal where the atoms and molecules are really well ordered and then you when it melts they're disordered so that's one example of where it's very clear to see that the atoms and molecules fall into a disordered situation on the other hand if you then somehow make it so that you create a crystal so you take all those 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 molecules and they come together to form a crystal then you'll go if you think of it really naively, and it's something we spend a lot of time with, with undergraduate students trying to get around this, then you go, well, hang on. Something that's really disordered is crystallized. Right. So what's going on? And the problem is you're missing something, which is the heat. 
the heat energy. When you form that crystal, there's a heat energy associated with that. And you've got to do your sums. You've got to do your accounting in terms of the energy correctly. And take into account that that heat energy, which is a disordered form of energy, that's, that's a key aspect as well. So when you talk about disorder, it's not just this idea of having everything ni ni nicely lined up. You've got to think about many, many different forms of disorder. So well, I've just tried to compress about four lectures. Into yeah, and, and that's, I should have I've asked the question. So because so, so the, the, the disorder has come through the process, not necessarily in the end result. Precisely. Precisely. That's exactly the way of, of, of so, Are you controlling oh. physicists? The like, Kevin, I'm suddenly <laughs> just like, I'm looking at you. Fuck, man. I, I found my, I don't know what happened. In, in my mind, there was like something about entropy and death, you know, and somehow in my mind, they are very okay. linked. Now. Like there's this kind of, okay, entropy, death, and suddenly I can see you jump, you know, can you do something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, you're absolutely right. In terms of entropy and death. So we talk about the heat death of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's all related to... With, with thermodynamic processes like steam engines or engines where what we want to do is we want to have, you know, you want to have a furnace and you want to extract energy from that. But you can never have an 100% efficient process. There will always be some waste. There will also be in every engine we have, even if you had the best theoretical engine you could ever have, you still won't get, you know, the best components. The machine to the fire and there's no friction at all. There's nothing, it's like, it's the ideal engine. You can never get perfect efficiency. I think, you've just, I think you've just broken the heart of, of multinational manufacturing companies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, unfortunately. So this is, this is, this is an, an unfortunately depressing aspect of, of fundamental <laughs> physics that we can never have perfect efficiency. And that means that what happens is when you're trying to get good, you're trying to get work out of some process, you know, you're trying to get a piston to move you're always going to have um, some of that useful work, that useful energy that's driving the piston. What happens is that some of that energy gets dissipated out as heat, even in the most ideal situation. And the word, the universe is not ideal. So that means that as we have these processes going, what happens is that we will continue to dissipate that energy. It continues to go out into the environment up until the point where all we're left with is that useless energy. Not, the, not the energy that can do work. And that's the heat death. That's what we mean by the heat death of the universe. So you're absolutely right, Olivia. There is a direct link between death and physics. <laughs> so basically, death is a result of, of, of uh, total inefficiency. That's not a bad... Or, or even... <laughs> so the interesting thing is... Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good way of putting it. We talk about in physics, uh, equilibrium... Right, I don't want to turn this into a physics lesson, but if we get this point... Uh, across and that's all I get across in this this 30 minutes or whatever it is now um, oh. I'll be very very happy so we talk about um, oh let me see if I can find equilibrium here I'll use this little candle thing right so so if we've got that 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 mounted on there this this it's in a state of equilibrium it's just sitting there if I just move it off however it's going to fall off one side so it's no longer in a, it's no longer in equilibrium. So you you or if you've got a ball, you could imagine a ball sitting at the at the bottom of a valley, and it's in a nice. So if this is our ball and it's in the in a valley, yeah. that's an equilibrium state. If you push it up here on the side, it's going to fall down. So if it's up here, it's away from equilibrium, and in the bottom, it's it's at equilibrium. For life, we we need to not have equilibrium because the equilibrium state in physics, the, the, the state that every system wants to get to is its equilibrium state, or we call it its ground state. For us, that equilibrium state is death. So we need to keep moving. <laughs> we need to, that's exactly that's it. it. <laughs> we need to keep moving. We need actually, right down at the, uh, you know, at all levels and at the biomolecular level, we need to keep moving. We have to be driven out of equilibrium. I mean, that's the, 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 the death thing. I was thinking from a personal development point of view, I'm just thinking just other, <laughs> other things we work on. It's, it's, the the the, the is, is this is this so is this a law <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, it's um in terms of if we want to keep alive we have to be driven out of equilibrium that's you know that's that's yeah. i wouldn't quite say it's at the status of a law but it's pretty damn close we should yeah. copyright it right now at the moment yeah. Yeah. We should, i should make something about it I, I would have a last question actually for you philip is is actually your 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 man of science you know and you know something that maybe more personal you know what what is your relationship with that and you, does it mean something? Is it something that you think about? Is it something that powers you? What, what is it about you? What a great question. I actually thought about this a little bit before because I knew we were, I was doing this podcast. So 
does it worry me? I guess I kick it into the long grass. I don't think about it too much. It's not something that concerns me on a daily basis. I look after my health reasonably well, but do I worry about my health and you know where I'm going to be in 20 years' time? No, I must admit, I don't. I try to live each day for itself and try to get as much out of each day. What really, um, my father and I were never cl particularly close. Um, he passed away about eight years ago. And what surprised me is just how much his death really hit me. It, it's, um, you know, at strange odd times of the day, I'd find myself thinking about him, remembering him. And it, it's again, coming right back to what we said at the start, it's in terms of, you know, it's what you leave and the impact you make in this world. And those little connect, you, you talked about having big major interconnections and thinking about like quantum physics or whatever. We don't even need to go that far. It's just like, you know, you have these knock-on effects and things that you seem are incredibly trivial to you, you know, will have knock-on effects and they'll affect other people down, down the way. And it will have 200 students coming through a year or whatever. And you're standing in front of those classes and, you know, trying to do your best to teach them. And then they go, they graduate. And then what happens, you know, you'll have them 10 years down the line come back and tell you something that you'd completely forgotten about that you'd said in a lecture you know, got them to think in a slightly different mm. way. That would be about the only way I'd sort of worry or think about mortality, I guess. It's not, I, I don't spend my time worrying about death, but I do certainly like those little events where you realize, oh, actually, you know, at some small level, I did actually make a small difference there. And that's, I, that's to me what life is about. I, th I think that, that that's that fit, it feel like a tagline of our stuff is death, it's about life. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, Everything matters. There are no ordinary moments. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Again, please support the show by signing up at deathhangout.com or clicking on the subscribe button on your screen.